I'm John Olson. I live in Prospect, and I go to church at uh, St. Bridget's, right around the corner. So I'm I'm a local guy. Um, in 1962, I was working for Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, and I was a little bored with my job. And I saw a full-page ad in Newsday, the newspaper on Long Island. And the ad said, software people wanted, you know, come all, all levels, all positions, all kinds of positions, interesting project. OK. So I went for an interview. And uh, they hired me on the spot. And I had no idea what the project was. Uh, I started writing some subroutines that had to do with uh, aircraft navigation, but, you know, that didn't mean anything. Um, then they said, by the way, uh, you're going to apply for top secret clearance. Okay, interesting. So, uh, but you can't do anything on the project until you get your top secret clearance. So, again, back to the cubby hole doing, you know, sort of menial things. And then uh, they said, OK, it's the SR-71. And it still didn't mean anything to me until I got out to Edwards Air Force Base to start really working on the project. And that was 1962. Um, I got to pat the Blackbird on the nose while it was being tested. We worked at that time in a trailer developing the software out in the desert. Uh, it was software, uh, I'll go into more of it later, but it was basically software that was planned the missions. So the uh, commanders would say, uh, we're going to fly over Cuba, and we want to hit, you know, 37 targets. But we want to avoid these six areas in Cuba. Do the best possible mission for us, and then create a tape, and we'll put it in the plane and fly the bird. So that's what we did. We created the tape based on the mission inputs that flew the plane. Now, you, sh you should understand that the plane was so damn fast that you couldn't manually fly it and hit all the targets, because you had to worry about the camera angle, the sun angle, uh, you know, avoidance areas, all these things. So the pilot was more monitoring what was going on than actually flying the plane. The software that we wrote flew the plane. The next year I went out to Beale Air Force Base where we did the beta testing of the software and the beta testing of the aircraft. And that continued until 1967 when the software was accepted by the Air Force. And uh, by the way, I also went out to SAC headquarters at that time and tried to get the software there, not too successfully. Um, the amazing thing about the software was that it ran for over 20 years. Now, you see Microsoft come out with software, right? And they have release, uh, you know, 2.0, 3.0, blah, blah, blah one level of software for 20 years. Think about it. Uh, that's what we did. So we'll talk about that afterwards. Before Now, the book talks about the software first and then goes into what did the pilots think of the plane, what did the pilots think of the uh, software. Again, the view from the pilots, the view from the navigators, the view from the ground crew. So a lot of perspectives of the plane and of the, sof <coughs> of the software that flew the plane from the people that were actually involved. Uh, and again, the beginning of the book was uh, the, the uh, effort involved in writing the software. So with all that in mind, one of the pilots, Brian Schull, is a much better speaker than I, and he's going to talk in a video about the plane itself. I don't want you to confuse me with anyone that's famous or important. Uh, a good landing is the one you can walk away from. A really great landing is when you can use the airplane again. Uh, I did not do either of those things, crashing an airplane into the jungle one day. 
uh, who I am is the luckiest speaker you will ever see at a podium anywhere you go. And I think after the presentation, you will agree with that. I didn't feel very lucky. One day my aircraft was hit, going down. I couldn't get out. It was too low. And in moments I knew I was going to die. It was a very sobering feeling to know that you're about to die and hit the jungle. And it's going to be over. And I thought, well, I've done everything I could do. And a little calm came over you at the last minute. And I thought, it'll all be over in a heartbeat. It'll be an explosion. Instantaneous, painlessly, I'll wake up in heaven. And the next thing I remember was a great deal of fire and smoke and heat and flames. And I, I thought maybe I didn't go the way I, I thought I, I was going to go. <laughs> Recognizing I was still alive, I got myself out of the plane. And if you want heroes in my story, you're going to have to wait till the movie comes out. The special forces guys that found me got me out of there. That, that, those were the real heroes. And they, I, I remember just one moment of that. I'll tell you, they couldn't get a helicopter to come in there. It was like too far. We're out of gas. We're too close to Cambodia. It's not our sector. And I thought, this is not the, the movies I watched as a kid. The, the hero is down. We need to rescue. I finally got an army chopper on uh, frequency. And uh, you know, you can talk army people into just about anything if you try. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, we got him down there. And he said, I can't, I can't put it down. Uh, there's not enough clearance. Uh, the rotor, the, I'll lose my crew. It's just too dangerous there. And these guys were so dedicated in getting that pilot out of, the, out of the jungle that day. The guy hovered over me, pointed his M16 at the chopper, very clearly on the radio said, you either put it down or we'll shoot it down. <laughs> and I thought at that moment, I am on the right team of players. <laughs> the next thing we heard was, I, I think we can put it down. Uh, never landed the helicopter, orbited just a few feet over the, hovered a few feet over the uh, ground and they stuffed me in like a sack of potatoes and flew me back and they said he's going to die before he get him across the Pacific. So send him to Okinawa, let him die there, we'll shoot him home in a box. And that was, that was my, my fate that day. Next thing you know, I'm in Okinawa for two months. I would like to tell you that I was in intensive care for two months. I would like to tell you that I was very brave and heroic and uh, courageously uh, fought the pain and uh, be a big fat lie. I was a big baby, I was cursing my attendants every day, crying and screaming, I'm praying to God every night, please, you have the wrong guy, I can't do this. My body went from 180 pounds of raw steel, as you see today, uh, <laughs> to 119 pounds of blood and gauze. They said, if you lose another quarter of a pound, we cannot save you, we can't put IVs in your arms, you're too badly damaged, injured. And I got to a point where I didn't even want to live. Now, this is a horrible admission from a guy who goes all over the world as an inspirational speaker, but I'd be lying if I, if I said it was any other way. And I, I just kind of was giving up. And uh, there has to be a turning point to every story, of course. And uh, mine was kind of a silly thing, but, uh, but yet an impactful thing in the way I was thinking. I was laying there one day looking out the third floor window in Okinawa, and I could see the end of the runway at Kadena. I could see the soccer field where the kids were playing every afternoon. It was April, and I could hear them out there kicking the ball and playing. And I saw the beach, and, the, and I thought, well, how was those kids once? I, I'd love to be back out there and have a life, and I, I'm just at such a young age. I'm, I'm, my life's pretty much over. And at that moment of you know, despair, Judy Garland came on the radio singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. How many of you know the words to that song? Anybody? No, you don't. Put your hands down. <laughs> you thought you did, just like I did. It's from The Wizard of Oz. It's a great song. You go, no, 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 no. That is not a kid song. That is not a silly movie song. That is a philosophically adult concept song about daring to dream, about dreams coming true. That song is so deep when you actually listen to the words. For the first time, the words penetrated my brain that day sharper than any scalpel the surgeons were using. And I thought, it isn't about that pot of gold. I could look out the window and see the other side of the rainbow and those kids uh, kicking a soccer ball. And I thought, I'm changing my attitude tomorrow. I'm going to try to eat the food. The thing was, I did, my body was rejecting the food. I am going to try tomorrow. I have a new attitude. I've turned my whole, God, it's okay. Forget all that stuff I said for 30 days. I'm, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And the next day they came in with uh, the food. And you know, isn't it amazing? They could see it in my face, in my eyes. Isn't it amazing how a change of attitude in the slightest way in your life can affect the whole rest of your life? Attitude's everything. Education, being brilliant, uh, the material things, uh, it, all that's great. Skills, great. Knowledge is great. But you got to put them in the right direction. And I had the attitude. And, and they came in, and I couldn't eat the food. It wouldn't go down. 
And they were beside themselves because they say he's really trying now. We want to save this guy. He looks like hell, but he's, he's got that look on his face now like he is not giving up. And they couldn't, the food wouldn't go down. And they said, you're going to die. Finally, an army corpsman had a sack lunch his wife packed. He said, maybe, maybe there's something in here, anything. They were desperate. And there was, there was nothing except a small plastic container of cherry cooling. And the cherry cooling went down real good. And they ran to the commissary and they got every pack of cherry Kool-Aid they could find. And I drank 3.2 gallons of cherry Kool-Aid the first day. I lived on four to five gallons of Kool-Aid a day for five days. And uh, got some, uh, well, I peed real good. Uh, okay. And they said, that's even a better sign. Your body's functioning and it's internally working. It just needs nourishment. Then crackers, then bread. Next thing you know, I was eating. Next thing you know, I was met back, back home. And I'm not not here today because of Cherry Kool-Aid. I'm here today because I changed my attitude and I changed my direction of thinking. And that's, that's so important in life. I mean, when I used to teach young fighter pilots, the attitude's everything. I'll teach you the stick and rudder, but if you don't have the right attitude, you're going to kill yourself anyway. Got back to the States, spent a year in the hospital. I'm not going to bore you with all that tonight. We have more fun things to talk about. Popped out of the hospital one day, much to the shock of the U.S. Air Force, it said, I'm sure he's never coming back and never going to fly again. They said, oh, we, I guess we got to take him back. He passed the physical, which was a miracle in itself. If you don't think I'm already the luckiest person in the world at this point in the story, then you're, you're not listening. And a little blue car pulled up to the hospital, and I got to go back to the Air Force and, and be a pilot again. But what I took back with me out of that experience was, it was like I was starting life over. It was like I was reborn. So I was like a two-year-old now. Going back, I'm two years old. Now, having a two-year-old in the squadron makes colonels very nervous. <laughs> makes other people very excited because we're enthused. We'll try anything. We're fearless. When I got out of my hospital experience, I learned a lot. But the, the basic things I'll share with you tonight, one was live fearlessly. What are we waiting for? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Two, life is short and it's uncertain. And because it's both, how can you miss the opportunity of each day? And thirdly, Fearlessly pursue your passion in life. Don't wait. Put it off. Do it now. Don't care what everyone else says. Don't care if they laugh at you. Don't have that fear. Well, I'm not very good. I don't do that very well. I don't have enough money. on it. Forget all that. The day I could not be laying in a burn ward anymore, I'm going to run like a locomotive. If I fall down, fine. At least I'm still moving. So I had this new attitude. Went back in the Air Force, flew jets. I was a big story in the Air Force, which I did not want to be. It's very embarrassing to flash your big fat scarlet face across the airman magazine and oh well, this is great the guy came back fine it made me very uncomfortable i wasn't ready to be a rock star over uh leaving your jet in the jungle I, what was your big accomplishment nothing you survived but deep down inside i knew that i'd learned a great great lesson so i was a man carrying a camera around all the time because camera uh, photography was my passion and who knew what it would lead to Point to any successful person today in any job that you think, and you'll find someone that has a love and a passion for what they do. They just love, you know, Bill Gates, he's, a, he's an idiot to want to sit with and have coffee with. You wouldn't want to talk to him. He's so boring, but the guy has a love and a passion for what he does. And, you know, guess what? He's just slightly successful. <laughs> I had a love and a passion for flying and just doing and being and being so alive. So I was like a two-year-old in the squad. Fast forward to one day, I said, well, I'd like to fly the world's fastest jet. And uh, I said, well, you were lucky enough to get back back in flying, but uh, we don't think that you're you're ready for that because you got to breathe 100% oxygen in a spacesuit while you're flying the world's fastest jet. And uh, we, just, we just don't know about all the scar tissue thing because you're like the first guy that came in. And I looked at him and I said, again, they're terrified because they're adults. I was a 12-year-old when I got to this plane. I was 12. <laughs> And I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, attention, I went into surgery 15 times and, oh, they were giving me 100% oxygen every time, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> I scored the sixth highest score they ever had on the astronaut physical at Travis Air Force Base because I was motivated. They put me on that treadmill like this and I, I was to run into uh, my heart and the guy said, damn. Nobody's gotten to that level. He says, I'm just playing with you now. He says, I just, you know, so I see you drop dead here. And uh, he said, you know what's funny? He says, you had no internal injuries. Your, your internal structure was so strong that went through that, it's almost like it was like it had a workout or something, and it's so strong now. 
that, yeah, you, externally you look like you're, you're, you're weak or bad or things, but internally you say, gee, so next thing you know, I can fly the world's fastest jet. Now, that, that, up to that point in the story, that'll make a great movie someday, I'm sure. I'm sure, you know, Tom Cruise is gearing up for that role or somebody. What's <laughs> oh, so funny? Uh, <laughs> for those of you that are unfamiliar with the world's fastest jet, and this audience probably, there's not too many, but uh, fastest aircraft ever built. This was your guardian of freedom for 25 years, built back in the early 60s. Gary Powers was shot down in 1960 in the U-2. President Eisenhower went to Lockheed, said, build me an airplane they can't shoot down. 18 months later, they rolled out an SR-71. That wasn't 18 years, F-35 people. That was uh, 18 months. This, uh, <coughs> Anyway, back then you could do things like that. Not only was it the world's fastest, highest flying aircraft ever built, it was built out of titanium. You can't forge titanium. They had to hand build each one. But they wanted an airplane that, that could spy on the other side with impunity and not be shot down. We cruised around at 2,000 knots. If you fired a high-powered hunting rifle, the bullet exits the muzzle at 3,100 feet per second. This aircraft would cruise with ease in a climb at 3,200 feet per second. The aircraft had, had a crew of two, pilot and a navigator. As a pilot, I got to ride in the front seat, which I thought was a very good place to put me. The jet was way ahead of its time. They only built about 35 of the strategic reconnaissance versions that were just for cameras, no weapons at all. Only 93 men in history got to fly this airplane. I always felt like I appreciated it more than the other 92. And only one guy in history was carrying a camera around. Least photographed jet in history. Not allowed to take pictures. Top secret, all this stuff. And, and it was. But if you were around the airplane long enough, you could get permission, get approval, get the signature, and do it because it was a passion. I didn't know I was going to be a guest speaker, write books, or do any of this stuff. I just knew I'm near the most elegant aircraft ever built. I'm, I even have been doing this. How can you miss the opportunity if you're into your photography? And, you, and I didn't have any idea what I would do with those Kodachrome slides. This is back in manual, camera, manual, everything. 35 roll, 36 to a roll. This was the jet that gave way to no other airplane when it taxied out. This jet served six different presidents, did more to help win the Cold War than you will ever know. This airplane, I was crewed with uh, Walter Watson, uh, as we already introduced his brother-in-law here today. Walter's the one on the left. Hey, uh, <laughs> Walter has the distinction of being the only black officer in Air Force history to be a part of this program. And he wears that title proudly, speaks at many uh, events around on his own. Sometimes we do shows together. We do a two-hour thing called Spy uh, Pilot Chronicles, kind of fun. Walter was a brilliant engineer. We're best friends to this day. We, I just talked to him yesterday. That man was brilliant in the back seat, and you needed somebody in that back seat to be brilliant. We wore the same kind of spacesuits like the shuttle astronauts did. They, in fact, used our suits for the first shuttle mission back in, in 1980. Uh, so it, we had, you're flying above 90,000 feet. You're flying at about 85,000 feet at 2,000 knots. This is what my cockpit looked like, your basic 57 Chevy. There's nothing cosmic about this. <laughs> First time I got on the plane, I said, oh my God, I feel a little naked. No guns, no bombs, no rockets. Uh, well, at least I can flip a camera switch on and feel like I'm doing my part. No, no, nothing in the front seat. Walter had all the cameras, all the sensors, all the calm jamming and all. My job was to keep the pointy end forward. <laughs> and that was a full-time job in this airplane. I told Walt, hey, if we're ever shot down, you're the spy, I'm just the driver. <laughs> Now, getting used to the space helmet did take a little, a little getting used to. Yeah, that was kind of different. As a fighter pilot, you can take your uh, oxygen mask off and fly, scratch your face, wipe sweat out of your eye, or if you're a Navy pilot, pick your nose, or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> whatever it is they do. <laughs> Pensacola, I love it. <laughs> but now, you were entombed all the time for the next five, six hours. You're breathing 100% oxygen, and you just hear yourself breathing. So now, the helmet was a little different. And they told you, watch out what you eat before you go, because as you know, as you go higher in elevation, the evolved gases in your stomach expand. So if you eat a real gassy meal or something, you, you know, you've been hiking <laughs> in the mountains behind the guy that ate the plate of beans. You know what happens as you get high. <laughs> so I, I was a new guy one day, and they were kind of playing with me, and they said, hey, Brian, have the ham and cheese omelet in the flight kitchen. It's very good. In fact, have extra cheese, because the protein will be really good for you for that long mission. I go, oh, that sounds good. Protein, cheese, okay, pile it on. 
passing 52,000 feet in the climb that day, I thought I was going to give live birth to in the cockpit. <laughs> And Walt's got, are you okay? What's wrong? And I, I'm making noises. And finally, at 71,000 feet in the climb, I very tearfully realized just how self-contained that entire uh, suit is. That's really a pain. Uh, so uh, you had to be very careful about what you ate. You had a little heating and cooling knob here for hot and cold. You were, you were always too hot or too cold. There was never any comfortable... Uh, but you'd sit in that seat anywhere from three to six hours on an average uh, mission. Uh, here we are getting ready to fly. Much more fun in the front seat. Got a view, got a window. Uh, Walter's back there working the, the, the navigation system, working the, the, all the cameras and sensors. and all, It's a really full time, and he was just a brilliant guy. Had the best back seat in the squadron. But if you look closely at our, our flight seats here, before we fly, it, mine kind of has a happy face on it. <laughs> Walt, Walter, not so much. <laughs> now, we only had 15 pilots in the squadron at any one time. I was out of the country six months out of the year. We had three locations that flew spy missions to cover the entire world geopolitically. Okinawa, two jets. England, two jets. Beale Air Force Base near Sacramento, California, the 12, 13 jets. That, that was our main base. So we'd rotate for six, seven weeks at a time. You could just read the paper and see what was going on and know where the SR was flying. Oh, Honduras now is happening. Oh, Cuba just got MiGs. Oh, uh, East Germany is moving missiles. And you didn't, it wasn't any secret. And you're not hiding a 900 degree Fahrenheit heat source from anyone. They knew you were there. They knew you were coming. They tracked you all the time. They just got tired of taking shots at you and not hitting you, and they got embarrassed. The Soviets finally, finally kind of quit. Over 4,000 missiles were fired at this plane in 25 years. Not one, not one piece of one was ever hit. This is Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. One day, uh, Ronald Reagan, who was our commander in chief, who knew how to use this airplane effectively, we always thought, knew that the communists were having a big conference up in North Korea, and they invited all the bad guys there, the Chinese, the Soviets, the Vietnamese, the Koreans, they were all, but they didn't invite us. Ronald Reagan had Walter and I take off out of Kadena, go up to Korea, and we're flying figure eight butterfly patterns over the conference. And we're going, what are we doing? We have photographed the entire country in the first four minutes. But we'd go back out over the Sea of Japan, come back to it, and, and it was Ronald Reagan's way of sonic booming their coffee cup off the desk <laughs> at their conference every four minutes just to let them know, we know you're there, and now you know we're here and you can't do a thing about it. Uh, the jet carried a double sonic boom. One off the nose and one off the spikes, the inlets. And if you ever heard it, heard one, it was a baboon. It was uh, pretty impressive. A little footnote to history you may not be aware of. Behind the jet here is the Kadena Marina, where the, the Navy has a little officers club, and people are surfing and wind sail, wind surfing and sailing, learning how to sail and learning how to windsurf. And rumor has it, and I, I, I don't know how true sure this is, but that some SR-71 pilots on takeoff would suck the wheels up 10 feet off the deck and full burner go ripping across that marina and knock the windsurfers over. And I, I think that's just a rumor. Oh, I'm personal. <laughs> This is one of my favorite all-time pictures. Uh, very difficult to get the jet you know, all completely in, in the picture. It's in that moody England countryside. It's a dark, a cold uh, winter day. And you can see the smoke. The, the jets, you can only run up one engine at a time. It's so powerful. They, they, it, within about 30 seconds, this guy's going to be taken off on a real mission. He always had a mobile car with a couple people in it. Run down the runway, make sure there's no debris. So my passion was the photography. And every chance I could get, I wanted to get a picture for reasons I didn't even know, except I knew I wanted to do it. And as a 12-year-old, I, you know, would, <laughs> would push the limits. And uh, this, all the photographs that you're seeing today represent the world's rarest collection of Blackbird photography anywhere. They're all my own images. And I wasn't a great photographer. I didn't know what the word aperture meant on my camera. But I'm sitting in the mobile car this day with the colonel. Not Walter, the Colonel. And we're watching this incredible scene of them running up and the whole earth is shaking and there's just the jets just leaning over and then they run the other one. It's like a tiger on a leash. It's so magnificent, so you just can't take your eyes off it. And he looks over and he said, What's that camera doing on the seat? And of course, as a 12 year old, I go, Huh? What? Me? You're talking to me? Uh, Hey, camera. I, yeah, I didn't, I don't know how I got there. And then he looked back at the jet and he's like kind of upset and, uh, you know you're not supposed to have the camera out here. 
And I go, oh, well, yeah, of course, but now it's too late. We're here, and, you know, I don't think it caused the, you know, the situation here. And without even taking his eyes off the plane, he, he, you know, we're just staring. I said, you know, sir, that would be an incredible picture in your office. <laughs> flew the plane never had great pictures in that because you just you have that same old Lockheed picture, the Lockheed photos. And he never even looked at me, he just said, You got ten seconds. <laughs> and I got on the runway, put me and, and I, I tell this story because I really didn't know what I was doing photographically. I was just I was passionate about the, the, the scene and the my little Nikon F3 and the that stupid aperture thing, whatever it was. And I, I had this zoom lens and it allowed me to get the whole plane. You just, it's just so hard. It's an angular uh, plane. I got that on the runway in 10 seconds and I didn't even know if I really focused it or not. People love this picture. We made a big one at home in my gallery. But, wow, that's real photography. There you go. If you only knew how it was taken. And it's a great example of my entire theory about love, uh, what you do. If you never heard one take off, your life's incomplete. I'm sorry. Uh, this was the sound that penetrated your skeletal frame and just went right through your body. The best I can relate it to is the funny cars at a drag race when you get up too close to them and you feel it you know, pounding you. Uh, I loved it. I loved the sound of it every day. Uh, we call it the sled, the blackbird, the haboo for the black snake in Okinawa. Uh, I don't want to make any Cessna drivers feel bad here tonight, but uh, from brake release to 26,000 feet leveling subsonic at 450, 3 minutes, 51 seconds. Uh, I think that's about three days in a Cessna. I'm not sure. <laughs> It gets better, you know. <laughs> got the Navy, got the Cessnas, okay. You know. uh, if you're going to go that fast, you're going to have you burn a lot of gas, and you're going to have to refuel two to five times in any given mission. You got to come down. You got at 290, we fall out of the sky. You're taking on 65,000 pounds of fuel, changing your gross weight by 65,000 pounds. You're going to slide off the boom. You're going to light one burner to stay on. You're going to fly sideways. All that every time. Those guys could barely give you 300 knots. If they gave you 305, you were in heaven. You were so happy. Uh, you try this at night, in a turn, in turbulence, in a storm, you just, they, they, it's an insanity. It's like landing uh, on carriers at night in the Navy. I, I respect those guys so much for doing that because this, this was like kind of our crucible. Now you may say to yourself, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that illegal to do acrobatics in a refueling area? How'd you get that picture? Moving on. <laughs> We're going back. That is such an incredible shot. Really, you you will never see that picture. I was with the Air Force photographer one day. They needed someone to fly the Air Force photographer. He said, "You guys have been photographed once in 25 years. We're, we're going to do an Airman magazine thing. So who would who would like to fly the Air Force?" Well, I ran over three guys, and I said, "And and then we got everyone." He said, "Hey, Sarge, I got I got my camera, David. You want to take the stick and a little bit here?" And he goes, "Wow, you let me fly!" Oh, he was so excited. So so we did do a we did do a little uh, a little extra there, but get you an idea the size of the airplane. It's a big airplane, carried 80,000 pounds of gas. And you are basically a flying fuel tank, and you're going to burn through that gas uh, at those speeds. Now, my days off, I'd go up with the tanker guys to get, just to see it and get a picture. I, don't ask me why. And people would tell me, what a pain in the butt that is. You've got to get approval, you got to get signed off, you have to go up four hours earlier, orbit out there on that barf bucket, and then you got to go back there with the, with the boomer, you got to lean over and try to get a picture. It's so much, it's just a big pain. And I'd look at them and say, pain. Pain is laying in a burn world where they're ripping skin off one part of your body to sew it on another part. Now you got a new wound on your body. You're sitting under a heat lamp in the middle of the day trying to heal a wound you didn't even have. And you're, you're like a, at 130 pounds and you're so miserable, you want to throw up, but you can't. I said, this is living. How could you miss it? Now, I didn't say that. I just looked at them like, God, they're such adults. They don't get it. How could they miss it? <laughs> Coming off the tanker, one of this another one's Rembrandt Light. And people go, wow, this guy knew what he was doing. Photo. That must be National Geographic. No, that was B. Shul. What the hell does Aperture mean on my camera? I still don't know. <laughs> got back there at the boomer one day. He says, all right, I'm only going to let you get, you got 10 seconds, another one of these. You got five seconds, you know, and I'm zooming. They bank 12 degrees, early morning sun over the South China Sea. You get to see the fuel sloshing out across the wing. The jet was built right. to leak subsonically. Rare, you won't see pictures like this too often. That's the fuel seeping out of the expansion joints. When we heated up to 900 degrees, the jet sealed like Tupperware. You didn't lose a drop. But subsonic, 
the jet was always dripping and oozing fuel. It was like it was alive. It was just oozing. And that's, that's, people say, wow, that's Rembrandt. Why, look, that's, that's just incredible. It must be time life, you know, photographer guy. And again, we didn't know for three weeks what you got, you know, photographed. One of my favorite, favorite pictures. Um, leaving the tanker, you're passing 50,000 feet. The sky curve turns a very deep, dark blue, and you're above all that weather you feared when you flew mortal planes all those years. Leveling at 84,000 feet, you look out and you say exactly what you just said. And as the 12 year old, I said, I gotta get a picture of this. And so I, I went back in the books and the regs, I said, is there anything illegal about carrying a camera in the cockpit? And you're not gonna believe this, but the entire uh, book, the Be No book, you know, the Be No uh, 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 this and that, <laughs> never once addressed uh, while flying the world's most sophisticated spy plane, you know, probably a good idea not to have a camera in your hand taking a picture away. And I took that to mean, well, of course it'd be okay. Uh, otherwise, they would have written it in there. <laughs> I, made, I got myself a small Instamatic, put it on a lanyard in my spacesuit pocket. Very difficult to do. I'd sit in the hangar. This, you're going to get a kick out of this. I don't know any other guys that flew this jet. And I mean, I was in love with doing it. I, I think you know I had a passion for it. I'd sit in the, in the hangar on, the, on a Saturday when we're in Kadena, and then the crew chiefs would go, yeah, we're working on stuff. Yeah, I'd sit in the, and I'd practice the camera thing. Because when you're in that space, it, everything is, is, is much harder to do. You can't focus, has to be auto, everything. I got maybe six pictures like this in seven years. So not an easy, not on real missions. These are all training missions. Trust me, when you're flying a real mission, there was no, no photography going on. But to this day now, I have those six pictures, and I'm glad I can share with the world what that was like. Uh, and it was a beautiful thing. It took your breath away when you looked out. This is what the Arctic Circle looks like. And you might say, well, who was spying up there? Polar bears? And, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the Soviets put some new missiles up there one day. And we, we had to go uh, test, to see, see what they could do. And they send uh, us up there like we're kind of guinea pigs. Like, uh, you know, they might shoot one at you. So now we'll know what they do. Uh, I saw two sunrises and two sunsets on that uh, particular mission. This is winter time. Uh, I already admitted to you as a big baby in the hospital, I admit, I'll admit something else to you. I, uh, I used to look in the mirror some days, I put the green visor up just to see that I was really doing this. I checked the scarred face and I'd go, you are not dreaming this. Because in the hospital they gave you some drugs sometimes, some pain, and you'd have dreams like you're flying or something. You'd wake up and go, no, nah, it was just a dream. I actually had to see myself every night. I thought, you are, just 12 years ago, you weren't there. You are now doing this. And it was... Yeah, kind of a childish, well, I think a 12 year old would do, but uh, I really had to, had to think and stop in my life and say, wow, you, you are sitting on the, the tip, tip of the sword. Put the camera up there on auto timer, did this, that's an incredibly lucky, rare shot. The glare of the sun is just very uh, uncooperative for photography uh, in the cockpit. People always ask me, what were your favorite missions and all? This was one of, I have several. The coast of Vietnam, we got to go back over the very spot where I was shot down uh, 12 years earlier, and Walt and I laid down some sun and boom that day, I can tell you that. Uh, and it was pretty darn cool, you know, uh, to come into the officer's club on a Friday afternoon with your M3 Plus patch on, stand up to the bar and all the guys with the toy, the toy jets, you know, the F-15, F-16, they're all talking, you know, and uh, my instructor one day uh, comes in and we're there standing, you know, seeing all these, getting their eyeball in our patch, you know, and they know what to say. He goes, he stops the whole conversation with this remark. He goes, yeah, I did Nebraska in eight and a half minutes today. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, that's the best way to do Nebraska, by the way. You know. <laughs> if you haven't driven through there. Sometimes... Uh, We'd say a little prayer to him who holds all of us in his hands, and I always thought prayers got to heaven a little faster from 90,000 feet, which was a very good thing because there were no minor emergencies. When anything happened in this airplane, this is sunrise over Iceland. We took a jet from Sacramento to London one day, which was a three and a half hour flight. Uh, zipped across the Arctic Circle, got over to Iceland to hit the tanker, and the sun was right in your eyes all the time, but uh, I was lucky enough to have my little camera in my pocket. Coming back over Mount uh, Lassen, just south of Shasta, the, uh, up, we had the T-38 chase aircraft where I had a lot, of, I was an instructor, so I got a lot of opportunity there with another pilot in the plane uh, to do these kind of pictures. And again, you just had moments to do it. You never had enough time to do them. Sometimes the last 10 minutes of flight was the absolute worst. You were up there for five hours in clear blue. You, know, you come back, the weather's changed. All of a sudden, you, you took off on a sunny day and it's sopped in now. And you have fuel for one approach. They planned your missions. You, your job is to make gas. 
uh, you're coming across the fence at 185. You're not landing real slow. You, so you get, don't mess it up. So sometimes those last few minutes, you, you got really good. Now, if you want more than your 15 minutes of fame in life, you be an SR-71 pilot. Take your jet to a major air show where there's 100,000 people. Fly your jet over that show. Light the burners in their face. Land your jet at their show. Stand in front of the jet at the show. You are a sky god. <laughs> I had the uh, wonderful privilege of representing the United States Air Force and the SR-71 at the Dayton Air Fair, the Paris Air Show. Uh, I did the opening at Reno when I think we pretty much won our heat. Uh, this is uh, England where they used to get hundreds of thousands at an air show. And if your jet's there, they, everyone's coming to see it. It's the one airplane that was like, like the meeting the Pope. It was like they'd stand in awe and they'd look at it, afraid to speak. Then they'd look at you and they couldn't speak. Then they'd look at the jet. Finally, we go, hey, we're just Air Force pilots. We're not, we're not special astronauts or CIA guys. We're just Air Force regular guys doing, doing a really neat thing. Finally, when they, uh, you'd hear the same questions over there, they were kind of outrageous, like, oh, when you go into orbit, do you shut the engines down? Well, we, we don't go into orbit. <laughs> the magnificence of this airplane is that it's not a rocket, it's an air-breathing jet. And for it to be able to do what it did, and I recommend you read the Skunk Works and, and the Kelly Johnson story, was a phenomenal achievement to build this at all. Well, it's an air-breathing jet. But, you know, after you heard that question a number of times, you had to play with them a little bit, and I'd... One day, I, I, got, I was all hot, tired, and sunburned out there. I said, uh, the guy said, uh, well, you go into orbit. And I said, all right, come here. I'm going to tell you something, but you can promise. It's so classified. You can't tell anybody. And he goes, no, no, I won't tell anyone at all. They're, just so, they're so excited to be a part of the mission. I said, uh, went around the backside of the moon, and we shut one engine down. <laughs> And we used the moon's gravity to sling us back, to, and he's just, his eyes are this big. And I said, but you can't tell, that's very high level. <laughs> no, no, he, he ran back to his family and told them everything. And, uh, <laughs> so it was kind of fun. If you were a Blackbird pilot, you also got to fly Baby Jet, the T-38 here over Lake Tahoe, as a uh, little companion trainer to stay current in formation, instrument, night flying. But it was more fun. Now, Walter and I could go out together for crew coordination. Hey, it was just, here's the sports car, go out for an hour, fly around. And Walter, Walter was having, I was teaching him uh, how to fly. I had a stick now and a real view. Here, here's Walt demonstrating straight and level flight. Um, <laughs> We had the most beautiful flying area from Mount Shasta to Yosemite. It's a piece of geography if you, you flatlander folks in Florida aren't aware of. It is a magnificent, uh, Lake Tahoe's in the middle of that. And we would fly around, so of course camera boy could not resist, and people always gave me such heat, like, well, you got the camera again? These are the same people that today have called me and said, can I, can I get a print for my home? I, I'm really proud that I did that one day, and now I have no pictures of it. And I said, of course, I'm happy to send him one. But uh, we, we really enjoyed the little sports car. Walt and I had a lot of fun. But what we really used it for was a, a safety chase. Here the SR-71 has an emergency right after takeoff. It's dumping fuel to lighten his gross weight so he can land immediately. The T-38 is going to offer a safety assistant chase. Uh, we just happened to be airborne that day, and someone just happened to be have a camera. And that's a rare shot of the two of them together you rarely see. Uh, and we don't like to dump fuel that low. Uh, the rice crop in California did taste a little different that year. Um, uh, there's only one picture in tonight's show completely that I will say that isn't actually, uh, I knew what I was doing as a good photo. That is a tremendous photo because somebody figured out what the word aperture meant. <laughs> this is in year 20. I'm getting ready to retire. One of my last few flights in the T-38 were over Mammoth Lakes. And I said, all right, guys, I've got this figured out. i got a cable release. I can put my arm down. I can snap the picture. I can see you with my little Nikon lens. I took my gloves off, stuffed them. It was just a real setup. And I'm in focus, the jet's in focus, the mountains are. That is a dang good picture. It was such a good picture that some company in New York City picked it up, made a puzzle out of it, they went did a poster, and they said, do you have any other photos of any other, other jets there? And all of a sudden, when I was getting out of the Air Force, doors started opening at precisely the right time, precisely the right way that, that I could never imagine, only, only wish for. Uh, as my mom always said, she sent me this sign, says, uh, uh, I, we don't believe in miracles, we just count on them. And, and that's kind of how I felt. That same year, 1990, that I got out of the Air Force, the world's greatest jet was being retired, 1990. 
the most remarkable aircraft of the 20th century. The way it was built, what it did, and what it did for this nation. It was, it was undefeated. It was the jet that did the mission was intended to better than anything else. 1962, the first models were built. 64, the first, this one was built. You're sitting here today in 2015, it still holds every speed and altitude record. That is an amazing uh, fact. Well, that was a very sad day. Uh, they start flying jets off the base, one by one. They're in 30 museums today, and one at a time, jets just started, started leaving Beale, and it was really sad. And there came a really sad day when the last jet departed, and it was the end of an era. I would have taken more pictures that day, but tears welled up in your eyes as you realized you were saying goodbye to a legend you would never see the likes of again. Every MiG fighter pilot knew this silhouette wanted to be first to shoot one down. When Victor Belanco defected, he said, we could not understand how your decadent Mickey Mouse capitalist society could build an airplane in the 60s that we couldn't shoot down in the 90s. And the general got right in his face like a baseball umpire, and he said, that's what you can do in a country where men are free. It was just great, yeah, it was a great moment of American history there. And uh, they, he became an American citizen. Victor Blanco gave us the MiG-25. So we built the MiG-25 for one purpose, shoot that damn airplane down. <laughs> and he gave us one. He said, uh, so he became an American citizen. They said, what would you like to see? He said, only two things, Disneyland and an SR-71 up close. And we said, yeah, pal, that's the closest you ever got to one. <laughs> Leaving Air Force history passing through the gates of legend. If you have not seen one in a museum, there's 30 museums around the country. You got one in Mobile, Alabama, it's pretty close. Uh, you do see one. Well, go to Dayton, go to the Air Force Museum, it's really cool. Go to, they, they are just a remarkable uh, airplane uh, to see. Uh, I got out of the Air Force and uh, I had all these pictures, didn't know what to do with them, and now I'm still living that attitude. I'm still living that. Live the dream, pursue your passion fearlessly. Don't, don't worry about everyone says, go fly for the airlines. I didn't want to fly for the airlines. I wanted to ride and hike and do nature stuff. Um, back then, computers filled the room. Uh, you didn't have a computer 3,000 time, 3, times more powerful in your pocket. You had a room, a, a computer that filled the whole room, and that was, um, I use the term bearskins and knives. That, that's the, uh, the tools with, those are the tools with which we developed the software. Um, very primitive uh, by today's standards, but uh, we got it done, and a lot of hours out in the desert in Edwards, and then a lot of air, uh, hours out at uh, Beale Air Force Base, and finally uh, the Air Force approved it, and uh, um, we, uh, we had a successful project. When I went to write the book, uh, going back two years now, when I started the project, um, I had no idea that the software was running for 20 years. I had no idea that it would be as successful as, as it was. Um, and uh, we were lucky. We had a good crew and we did a good job. So if any of you would like to understand uh, the software development effort and hear from the pilots, uh, I would like to sell the book. You don't have to buy one. Um, but right now I'd like to stop and ask any questions, anything about anything. So uh, I'm going to step out here and, and field questions. Yes, sir. In 1962, how much did it cost to build the SR-71, and how does that translate into 20... That's a Lockheed seven. question. I don't know the answer to that one. You don't know how much you No, I don't know how much went into the Lockheed. You can look that up on your computer in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, there is a book um, that I refer to, uh, written by the base commander, um, Lock, um, Lock, I'm sorry, SR-71 Revealed, The Inside Story by Commander Richard Graham. And he goes in, it's a very large, very thick book, and it talks in great detail about the Lockheed development effort and, and you know, many things that, uh, you know, I did in a very small way in, in my book. But, uh, yeah, so I... I Yes. So hmm? the software development that you were involved in, sure, Dad. That was, was that for just the operation of the plane, or was that for the, you know, reconnaissance mission? You know, he said that this guy in the back was 
dealing with all the different cameras? The answer to that is both. Um, we created a paper, uh, not a paper tape, a mylar tape, which went into the Nortronics computer, which actually flew the plane. And uh, it fed the coordinates to the Nortronics computer. The Nortronics computer did stellar navigation, believe it or not. So you were so high up that um, you could use the stars to, uh, to navigate. And that's what the, the, the Nortronics system did. So, uh, so we, we, uh, we fed all the coordinates to the uh, Nortronics system, all the, you know, everything for the, to fly the plane. We also, created a film strip to go to the navigator in the back. So, and that was synchronized with the, uh, with the flight. So the film strip would be rolling along and this is where, you know, what you're supposed to be looking at and so on and so forth. So we had the information for the, uh, the reconnaissance information for the navigator and the flying instructions uh, built into the uh, Nortronic system and flying the plane. Yes, sir. Million. Beautiful. <laughs> but right now, if you rush to your nearest cell phone and go to eBay, <laughs> you can purchase a Blackbird tail fin for one million. <laughs> I'm a little short and change tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. I read a little bit about her. They developed JT7. I, I, I don't know that terminology. But I also read was that it was chemical combustion. So it's basically a rocket. Yeah. Could go out of the and for you, a question. Do you know what the limiting factor was on takeoffs? No, I'm not sure. The, the intake temperature for the, for the, uh, for the engine. Yeah. So the, the atmospheric temperature uh, dictated the temperature that would go into the engine and if it was too hot you couldn't fly. It was, if it was real cold you could go up to 90, 90,000 feet plus but if, uh, if it was too warm you couldn't even fly. The, uh, it, it was that sensitive. Sir. It tried and it didn't. Oh, they tried it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, nothing could shoot it down. Nothing could shoot it down. And it, uh, yeah, sir. So Lockheed made the aircraft. Who made the engine? Brett Whitney. Brett Whitney, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Did you just go over again? So why did they stop building them? It's because they got Satellites. Satellites. Oh, the satellites. And you might, there are probably some environmentalists that said, uh, you know, what are you doing to, uh, you know, spilling all this fuel all over the place? And it was, not, uh, it was not aerodynamically efficient, let's put it that way. Uh, it, you know, it, it really burned a lot of fuel and... and uh, but it was effective in other ways. It was effective. Just having, <laughs> just having oh, and, and, and the... Yeah, by the way, the, the plane is now uh, declassified. The sensors are not. They're still classified. And uh, the only thing that changed in the software over that 20-year period, uh, two things. They changed from Fortran, the Fortran level that we used to write the, the software in, to a later version of Fortran. And then they, they updated the software for, for new sensors that they put in in, 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 the, in those 20 years. But so the, tw the sensor logic changed a little bit. In your experiment and everything, did you ever have connection with the skunk works? Only by name. Not, 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 not uh, with, with Lockheed, no. No, never.
maximum altitude and max speed? I don't know. Yeah. Because the U-2 was shot down. The U-2 was shot down much slower, and, and uh, I don't think it, I think that was more like 60,000 feet, but it was much slower. I didn't know that there were two bases. <laughs> I just rem remember, uh, you know, you're going back 52 years now or whatever, right? So, no, actually more than that, uh, 1962. So, uh, what, 57 years? Uh, but uh, I remember we'd drive out there, we'd, um, we'd work through the night, um, and we worked in the uh, trailers, and we'd sometimes stay late into the morning, and the trailers were out in the, on the runway in the middle of the Mojave Desert there. And uh, uh, you know, when we had to go to the bathroom, we'd go into the hangar with the uh, SR-71. But that, that, that's all I remember. What, what town are you from on Long Island? Um, Douglaston originally, and then Port Jefferson. Uh, I was living in Port Jefferson when... Oh, Grumman, yeah, 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 a lot. One of, the, uh, one of my co-workers, uh, my, my um, I think he was a, well, he was my, uh, my deputy, I guess, on the project. I was the group leader, and he was my, my deputy. He went to work uh, at Grumman and was there for many years, and he wrote a chapter in the book, actually. Oh. Yes? Absolutely. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you had to. You had to, yeah. Air Force was, was intimately involved in the development of the software. I didn't know if they had to just put the, your ideas together and then... No, 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 no. They had to be. They had to be. Anyone else? Sir? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. It was a hoot. <laughs> I... Uh, from a, from a um, you know, a technology, it wasn't as, as uh, technically challenging as some of the things I did later on in my life, but uh, it was certainly the most interesting thing I've, I've ever done in my life. When were you able to tell your family what you were doing? Nothing. Nothing. I couldn't tell, um, I couldn't tell my family anything for... 15 years, 20 years, something like that, yeah.